So how many people have read Hound of the Baskervilles at some point in their life? Okay, so as you all remember, in chapter four, there was a letter that was received with little cutout type things on it, which you're seeing in front of you over here as you value your life and so on. And I was trying to figure out what's going on, and Sir Henry Baskerville's looking at this. Sherlock Holmes picks up the paper, begins reading the economic section, and says, it was cut from this paper from the sentence. Astounding. People were totally baffled. Uh, Dr. Mortimer, who is a friend of Sir Henry Baskerville, says, isn't this just guesswork? And Sherlock Holmes says, no, we're it's a balance of probabilities, of scientific use of the imagination. And then he looks up at this address, and he says, this address was almost certainly written in a hotel. And Dr. Mortimer says, how in the world can you say that? That's the topic of the talk. The answer is a balance of probability, as Sherlock Holmes said. So what's our belief before observing data? Well, on the left, we have a hypothesis in light blue, we'll call it H for hypothesis, and an alternative. In dark blue, we'll call it A for the alternative. And between the two, we cover all possibilities and there's no overlap. And so the odds of this hypothesis is the probability, which for this talk is just the area of the shape you're looking at. So I'll use the word area, if you don't mind, of the area of the left side divided by the area of the right side. That's the odds. Now we observe data, and we want to know what our belief is after observing data. Well, once we have data, we're now in the blue ellipse. All the stuff outside the blue ellipse is not part of the data we observed, and we must ignore it, because it's not part of our evidence. And so the odds of the hypothesis given the data is now the left part of the ellipse, which is in the lighter area, divided by the area of the right part of the ellipse. You can see that's like a bigger number, because there's more ellipse on the left than there is on the right. What a likelihood ratio is, conceptually, it's the information gained by observing data. So what's Sherlock Holmes thinking? Well, he knows that the likelihood ratio are the odds of our hypothesis after we've seen the data, the numerator, divided by the odds of the hypothesis before we've seen the data. And we can calculate that. We just saw what these expressions were. Um, it's the area of the blue part of the, the ellipse divided by the area of the left part of the ellipse divided by the area of the right part of the ellipse. That's all in the data. So that's in the numerator. The denominator is what we believe before seeing data. And again, that's the area of the left rectangle, the hypothesis, divided by the area of the right rectangle, the alternative. That's all straightforward. There's no likelihood in here yet. But if you look at the right side on the bottom right, how you have something divided by something, divided by something else divided by something, right? If you just switch the order of the divisions by magic, something happens. Now we look at this, instead of left to right, from top to bottom. And we see that the numerator is the area of the blue ellipse on the left divided by the hypothesis rectangle on the left. That's a conditional probability. It's one area inside of another. It's the probability of the data given the hypothesis. That's a likelihood. The data is fixed. We change the hypothesis. On the, on the denominator, we have the, the conditional probability of the probability of the data conditioned on the alternative. If you look at the picture on the right, you see that little area of the ellipse, A and D, the alternative and the data, embedded inside the alternative rectangle. So what fraction is the ellipse of the total area of the rectangle on the right? So visually, that's what these likelihoods look like. They're just a little algebra trick. And what makes them interesting is that likelihoods turn out to be very easy to compute, and they have some very nice information properties. We'll now see what Sherlock Holmes did with this. This is what it says in the text, and we'll go through and identify. Remember, these are fountain pens. They're not the high-quality BIC ballpoint pens we use nowadays. So reading through this, in blue, I'm just going through it, he says, the pen has spluttered twice in a single word. I record that under data. He also says the pens run dry three times in a short address. That's more data in brown. I put over there, color coding this. Now, he says that a, a private pen or ink bottle is not usually allowed in the state. That's going to be the alternative hypothesis. It was not written in a hotel. But in blue, 
in a hotel ink and a hotel pen, you see this a lot, and that's going to be a hypothesis and at the very top. The letter was written in the hotel. I'm just taking out what he wrote and putting it into a form of hypothesis, alternative, and data. He also talks how to, about how to combine evidence, which is very important in uh, Victorian forensics. And we'll go into that. And then the action he wants to take is, is the likelihood ratio high enough that he's willing to spend money out of his own pocket to hire a boy to go around and check all the waste paper baskets in Charing Cross? That's the action. We don't bother with probability unless there's some action we're going to take. So that's our data. Now let's look at the pen data and the likelihoods. Uh, we see uh, the pen data below, and we see two splutters with the red ar arrows next to them. So the hypothesis, it's written in a hotel. The alternative is privately written. The data is the pen splutter. We see it happen twice in the one word Northumberland from Northumberland Hotel. He's looking at the address of this letter. So now we get a likelihood. The conditional probability of the fixed data given a changing hypothesis. Here it's the pen splutter data given the changing hypothesis that it's in a hotel. What does he say? He says it's rare to get anything else. Maybe it's 90%, 50%. But this is forensics, so we're going to be conservative. And so we'll say it's 50%, not 90%. And now looking at the denominator, what's the probability of the pen splutter data on the alternative hypothesis that it's a private pen, not written in a hotel? Well, he says it's seldom allowed to be in such a state. I'll say seldom is maybe 10%. So now looking at the numbers and doing the difficult math of 50% over 10%, those are the two likelihoods, we get five. If we used numbers like 90% or 10%, we would have gotten nine. We're going to get numbers around four, five, nine, ten, something like that, no matter what you put in. OK, so now we have the pen likelihood ratio. What's the other data? We have the ink data and their likelihoods. Um, here we see that uh, in the data on the bottom, there are uh, three arrows and places where the script is broken. So the ink ran dry. Well, the hypothesis is that if it's written in a hotel, what's the probability that the, that the ink ran dry as our data under the hotel hypothesis? Rare to get anything else, like 50 to 90 percent. OK, what's the probability of that fixed data, the conditional probability, conditioned on, it's not a hotel, it's a private pen. He says, seldom allowed to be in such a state, maybe 10 percent. So again, the ratio is the likelihood ratio of the likelihood of the hotel hypothesis divided by the likelihood of the private hypothesis for this data, 50% over 5% we see in the bottom is 5. So now we have likelihoods. But usually we like to combine evidence. You never hear a prosecutor summing up with his one piece of evidence. Usually something else is going on, nor do scientists do that. So we're going to combine the independent events by multiplying together in a joint likelihood ratio. We know that the likelihood ratio of the splutter, which will color code in blue, is likelihood ratio LR sub S is 5. And for simplicity, we will say that in brown, the ran dry likelihood ratio for that data of the hotel hypothesis relative to the alternative is 5. Well, we see on the bottom the likelihood ratio is a combination of all the evidence. In blue, we combine the splutter data. It's splutter twice. We get 5 times 5. The brown is it ran dry. That happened three times in the word Northumberland. Multiply that by itself uh, three times. We get five times itself five times, which is over 3,000. If we felt there was stronger likelihood ratio, maybe 10, we would have gotten 100,000. If we thought that it was a smaller number like four, maybe it would have been 1,000. Regardless, Sherlock Holmes decides to hire the boy to go through and check all the waste paper baskets by this evidence. Some of you came to the talk because you were hoping this had something to do with DNA mixtures. Okay, so DNA mixture evidence is interpreted exactly the same way. We begin with quantitative STR data and following the laws of probability. We're not allowed to touch that data. As you heard from Charles Brenner this morning, forget about thresholds, inclusion. Holmes would not have done it. Just wouldn't have done it. Um, so the peak heights we know are proportional to the DNA amount. The likelihood is how you explain the data under the alternative hypothesis, in this case, the different genotypes. The joint likelihood within a locus lets you scientifically, validly combine information the way it's been done since the Victorian era by combining the independent data that you have for each locus about the genotypes. Once you have your genotypes, you can 
get the likelihood ratio of the support for a match relative to the alternative that it's a random person in the population. And once you're finished with one locus, you can then get a joint likelihood ratio, at least if it's autosomal DNA, by multiplying the independent likelihood ratios to get a joint statistic. So let's look at an example from a case that I uh, testified in last summer. This is the Queen versus Mel Broughton, an alleged arsonist, actually now a convicted arsonist. And well, here's some data from VWA that you're seeing on the right. So it was a low template mixture. There were uh, presumed to be three DNA contributors. The amplification was done in triplicate. And then a post-PCR enhancement was done. So those tall peaks of 200 that you're seeing were really more like 10 or 20 on the pre-enhanced data. This is total low-level data that without enhancement would all be at peak heights of 15 or 30. With enhancement, you see the total dissimilarity between the three patterns from the same locus from the same item. No human max score was produced, but the computer was able to do something. What did it do? First, it could produce a likelihood by looking at every possible combination of the three genotypes, all the different allele pairs along with stutter, prefamp, um, uncertainty, all the thousands of variables, looking at each pattern. But because they're independently derived data of independent experiments, a joint likelihood function gives you far more information and sharpens the genotype that you end up, that probability distribution, to the point that where the, when the likelihood ratio was computed for this locus VWA, it was six. But as you saw from Hound of the Baskervilles, if you multiply 10 different loci with numbers like six, you can end up with, an, in, by independence, a valid joint likelihood ratio across all the loci, which in this case was over three and a half million. Okay, same principles. So what do we learn from this? Well, the Victorian scientists used likelihood inference. I don't have time to tell you about Jevons, the whole history, the books, but they did. And Sherlock Holmes found the likelihood ratio a very reliable way of solving crimes. And obviously, if The Hound of the Baskervilles was written in 1904, likelihood ratios have a long-standing general acceptance in the forensic community. The likelihood principle applies to DNA evidence. If it's science, it has to apply. What's the probability of the data under different hypotheses? And the likelihoods enable scientific combination of DNA evidence. Uh, not consensus profiles, nothing like that. If you have quantitative data and valid statistics, the math of the same math that lets you multiply the loci together is the math that lets you look at multiple amplifications or multiple items. In fact, Holmes would not choose to only look at one piece of data. He would always look at five. He was a really good scientist. If you want to read more about likelihood ratios, uh, I gave a talk at the Promega meeting last fall. And uh, the paper that I wrote for that is online at their website. It's also online at our website, at Cybergenetics. It's also uh, the narrated presentation of that talk is on our website, as this one will be uh, by next week. And if you have any interesting DNA, any just for fun, if you have questions of interesting cases where you think a good, solid, quantitative likelihood ratio analysis would be interesting with probabilistic genotypes, send me an email. I'll be happy to take a look and I'll show you how we can make the transition from the Victorian era to the 21st century. Thank you.